Park. Um, this time, the, the talk in the morning was mostly uh, dedicated to um, anti debugging, anti disaster handling, how to jump the binary, how to study the network protocols. So now we have a fully working, unpacked binary of Skype. Uh, we know a bit how it's going on uh, in the UEP and TCP layers. So we will be able to go a bit deeper into reverse in Skype and trying to um, to check what is going on uh, in some of the um, cryptographic related stuff in Skype, in the networking, uh, some stuff related to the APIs. And I will finish with the credentials uh, of Skype. So Skype is basically a uh, gold mine for reverse engineers. It's 19 megabytes of uh, undocumented and obfuscated code. Uh, it has a lot of protections. Every, almost everything is proprietary, and uh, there is a heavy use of cryptography, usually good use of cryptography. And uh, it's loaded with hidden and undocumented features. So uh, the work to carry out is far from being easy, and there is a, a lot of work to do. And basically, we don't have even done like a tenth of what is possible to do with Skype. Um, what to look for? We've basically searched some ways to divert Skype from its original usage. Uh, fun things to do with Skype. Um, clarify some common beliefs. Uh, like, for example, the Chinese blacklist stuff that is uh, almost uh, Skype one doesn't want to communicate about that, I think. And there are some stuff going on on Skype blogs and SkypeJournal.com, some stuff like that. And uh, we try to, uh, since there is a lot of cryptographic usage, uh, we try to uh, look into that and try to find some flows in all the functions used, used and stuff like that. Um, a, a thing that uh, Fabrice hasn't told this morning is that there are a lot, a lot of versions of Skype. It's ba basically a list of all the, the subversions of Skype uh, you can find. Uh, there is the normal one, uh, th so the third number in the version information identifies the subversion of Skype. So the normal one is 2.0.0. A few days ago, it went uh, the 2.5 went final. So there is more things to do, uh, and there are like more than 30 subversions. I don't have them all. I have uh, all those uh, written in here, and the two in red, Tom Skype and eBay. That's in Skype. Uh, I have some um, stuff added that is the governmental blacklist of uh, of some words. You can get all those versions uh, on the official website of Skype. You go basically to skype.com slash, uh, slash go slash get Skype dash and you add a keyword that identifies the subversion. So get Skype dash uh, eBay dash FR gets you the, the, the eBay dot uh, FR version of Skype. There is nothing much uh, that is different except a new tab with a, a browser uh, on the website of eBay.fr, for example. Um, there is a small disclaimer. Uh, since there are a lot of versions, a lot of subversions, that almost weekly Skype is releasing a new uh, sub subversion of Skype, it's quite uh, difficult to be up to date with uh, all the features and stuff. Uh, basically, if you spend uh, half a day unpacking 20 versions of Skype, and the next day you have a subversion going out, and every version is updated, you won't spend another half day uh, to uh, check uh, everything that is going on there. So everything, uh, we did some stuff on some older versions, or some newer versions, but uh, there might be some slight differences in all those things. Uh, I will start with the net networking part of Skype. Uh, we basically did some uh, some of the work this morning, and now uh, I will go more into the details uh, and uh, some things to uh, to dig into in the binary. The first one is the compression. Uh, in fact, each packet of Skype is uh, can be compressed. Um, the algor algorithm used is uh, arithmetic compression. It's uh, a lot more difficult than a regular zip uh, to implement and to reverse to. Um, there, in fact, it's usually coded in reals, 
uh, and uh, the interval uh, 0 to 1 is split into sub-intervals uh, that will encode a uh, sequence of uh, characters according to their frequency. For example, if you have the three characters A, B, C, and you want to uh, encode um, the, the string A, C, A, B, uh, you will subdivide your interval. Then uh, the first symbol is A, so you will subdivide the first interval. Then the second symbol is C, so you will subdivide the, the third interval. Then again, and again, and, and again, and then you will have uh, all the um, all the numbers in that small subintervals of reals uh, encode the string ACAB. Uh, the small thing that changes uh, with Skype is that it doesn't use reals but big numbers, uh, and it's a bit more not com more complicated, but uh, a bit different. Um, the thing you have to know about Skype, it basically works uh, as a um, uh, certification authority. Uh, it, so the, the binary embeds uh, 14 RSA moduli, uh, 2 of 4096 bits, uh, 9 of 2048 uh, bits, and 3 of uh, 1536 bits. Uh, there are, they are all in clear, uh, once you have decoded, uh, unpacked the binary, they are all in clear text uh, in the binary and you can find them quite easily. So, uh, how it works, the first thing uh, to do, in fact, for um, a, a Skype client would be to try to connect to uh, one of the login servers in order to uh, identify uh, the user. Um, there are a few IP and ports that are stored in the binary uh, and, uh, and basically if you can't connect directly to one of those uh, login servers, uh, Skype can use relays in order to redirect your connection to those uh, login servers. So if you just filter those IPs, it won't work because there, there are a list of two, almost 200 super nodes uh, hard-coded in the binary. Uh, this list changes with every version of Skype, so when you have a version of a new version of Skype, it will find his way, its way out by connecting through a supernode to one of the login servers. Uh, and if you try and blacklist all the 200 supernodes, you will have to do that with every single subversion of Skype. Uh, and if, for example, the Chinese subversion of Skype uh, will embed a uh, list of super nodes that are almost uh, all Chinese. That's in order to uh, make things a bit faster uh, for the logging part. So you cannot uh, use IP addresses uh, most of the time to uh, prevent a uh, Skype line to connect to the logging service. For the logging phase, the uh, first uh, hypothesis about, uh, about Skype that each message signed by one of the Skype moduli is trusted. So uh, the Skype client will um, will accept a Skype client will accept any message that is signed by one of these modules. And the second hypothesis is that um, the shared secret uh, between the client and the servers uh, is not uh, your user and password. It's a hash. Uh, MD5 hash of the user's information. That's basically uh, the username, uh, um, string, odd code string, and the password. That's the uh, hash of that. Uh, so when the client uh, want to first log in, uh, it will generate two 512 bits length primes, uh, compute uh, 1024 bits uh, RSA couple. Um, and uh, those keys will represent the user for the time of this connection. It will be used in order to communicate with other persons, and it will be used to be uh, identified by, um, by the, the servers, the server, or other thing. And then the client uh, might generate symmetric session keys uh, that will be encrypted using the, uh, the RSA keys and exchange either with the login servers or with other clients uh, when they want to talk to each other. Um, for the, the first authentication, so the, the client hashes uh, his login 
the, the strings backslash n skyper backslash n n password uh, with md5. And then uh, it, it will refer the, um, the result uh, with, uh, with the symmetric uh, key k with plus the, um, the public RSI key. Then uh, it will uh, send uh, everything, the, the session key encrypted with the RSM, uh, the Skype RSM address, and the encrypted data to the Skype server that will then be able to decrypt the session key and use the, the session key to decrypt the hash plus uh, public key of the user. So uh, it's, um, uh, yeah? How is the hash encrypted? Is it set encrypted? Or? Uh, I will come to that a bit later. That's in the part of the credentials and stuff like that. So uh, that's uh, for later. So that's uh, um, a, represent a graphic representation of what is going on. So there you have the login, the string, the password. That, the, that's go through MD5. Uh, that's the shell secret. There is the user modulus. Everything is ciphered with a key that uh, uh, is random. This key is encrypted using Skype modulus and uh, the encrypted shared uh, session secret is appended and everything is uh, sent to Skype. So uh, that's that pretty tough scheme. Uh, there is not much we can do uh, regarding to that, so that just for information. Um, so once you are uh, authenticated, uh, in fact, when the, um, the hash of the password matches what was first uh, recorded when you entered the, your first login password that is sent to the login servers, uh, the information consisting of your hash and your public key is ciphered with one of the, the, the Skype uh, modulus, and that is that will be. Uh, the thing that uh, will identify you, uh, it's sign not cipher, sorry. So everything, every time uh, there is a, um, you want to do something, you will send that uh, to uh, some other people, they will decrypt it using, using uh, did I say private? Public. In fact, it's encrypted with the private Skype modules, so everybody can check that with the public, uh, the public key. Look, yeah. So, um, uh, and that will be uh, almost the same thing for each user that can uh, encrypt something with his own private key that will be uh, decrypted with his public key on others' uh, clients, since the public key is known by everybody. If you search for a logging name, for example, Supernode will send back uh, the couple hash, or the couple um, login and public key, so that uh, he will know that you are the good person and there is a, an exchange based on that. Uh, here is basically what is uh, the public blob with the username uh, that's here. Then uh, the 1024 bits public key of the user here. Then there is a share one hash of all the data before. Uh, everything here is padding and there is one byte PC that identifies the end of, uh, of the blob. So this thing is encrypted with uh, Skype private key so that each person who has the public keys embedded in binaries can decrypt that, uh, very get the public key and then start to talk with the user here. Um, in order to communicate between two clients, uh, they exchange, uh, they, they get uh, each other's uh, public keys, uh, and since they are signed by, the, they are ciphered uh, by the Skype authority, uh, they can verify that. Then, in order to be really sure, they will uh, encrypt uh, eight byte challenge and send them to the other uh, peer. The other peer will be able to decrypt that and verify that the person uh, in front is really who is supposed to be. Uh, and then, uh, once they're authenticated to each other, they can choose a, um, a symmetric session key in order to uh, encrypt their traffic. So there are a couple of strings, but the, the challenge there that you can find better. There are much, many things to do uh, with Skype traffic once you know how it works and uh, once you have uh, the compression part and the obfuscation part, you can do almost everything you want with that. Um, there are some stuff uh, you can do. 
about detecting Skype traffic uh, without even using the obfuscation of the traffic. Uh, for the, um, for the, um, I, I would go into that, there's a UDP thing and TCP thing. For the TCP, in fact, uh, it will, uh, a TCP stream will begin with a four byte long payload uh, for which we know the clear text. So uh, there are 10 bytes of clear text uh, we know. We have the encrypted stream. So with a simple XOR, we can record the first 10 bytes of the ARC4 stream. And then uh, it is reused a bit later in the second packet of this send in TCP. So uh, you can record 10 bytes uh, of uh, encrypted uh, TCP stream. That's not much, but it allows you, since you know a bit how the format uh, is supposed to be here, uh, you can check that and verify that the first 10 bytes are uh, from uh, Skype or a client or not. Um, if you want to detect uh, UDP traffic, there is one uh, thing that is quite interesting. If you are uh, between, after, uh, behind the net uh, or something like that, uh, there is the thing that um, Fabrice talked about, about sending uh, at first, the very first time, a uh, public IP of zero in order to get his public IP uh, back. So that's uh, what we call the, the NAC packet. Uh, the characteristics are unknown. It's a 39 byte long packet. Uh, the, function, uh, the, the, the function number is seven. And uh, you have one of the, one of the, 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 the D words uh, that are following are necessarily one of uh, your public IPs. So once you know that, you can match all the 39 byte long UDP packets that have this uh, characteristic and that have your public IP there. Then you will be able to know that uh, a client, a Skype client, has been uh, introduced in your uh, network. That's uh, basically what can be done uh, with uh, IP tables. Uh, a simple rule, sorry. A simple rule will be uh, um, can be used in order to uh, match all the characteristics and decide that uh, this was indeed a NAC packet sent by um, by a, a, a foreign uh, peer uh, in order for the client to know his public IP. Um, there is one thing we can do that's diverting a bit the the. the the usage of Skype. Uh, in fact, we saw that uh, earlier. Um, we know that uh, in order to get the seed, uh, we basically do a CRC32 of the source IP, destination IP, ID, and some null bytes. It is absorbed uh, with the initial initialization vector that is also sent in the packet. This gives the seed, the seed goes into the RC4 key engine, then you have the um, RC4 key. Uh, the thing is that uh, every, every single uh, field up there is fixed since, since uh, it's sent by the, um, the client uh, that will appear on the network. And you can specify uh, the IV in those packets. So if you want, if you want to have uh, always the same seed, all you have to do is compute the CFA 32 of all those data and choose the IV so that seed XOR uh, CFA 32 equals IV uh, for a seed you want. So if you have just one seed, if you have just just one, uh, if you go for the seed the RC4 key, you can set the IV in order to get always the same seed and always the same RC4 key. So that's uh, basically you can just always uh, use the same RC4 key in order to encrypt all the UDP uh, traffic that will uh, go uh, into Skype. For TCP, it's different. It's set in the um, in the um, TCP stream, so uh, you cannot do that. Um, there are a couple of nice comments. There is one thing to know about Skype is that uh, it will always trust people who uh, speak Skype. 
So in fact, if you have um, if you have the ability to generate the LC4 key, if you have the ability to compress packets, you can send whatever you want to uh, um, a Skype client. It will get that and it will execute what is behind. Um, that's the thing that has been changed uh, by Skype in 2.5. There are many comments that you could send in UDP. So if it was in UDP, you didn't have to specify the real source IP. You didn't have to, uh, it was totally uh, stealth. And uh, since 2.5, it seems that the Skype people uh, read the Black Hat presentation that did Philip and uh, Fabrice, and they changed uh, the, the, the cool comments to be uh, TCP only, and some very sensitive comments to uh, be only from the currently connected supernode. So uh, a rogue client cannot do a uh, nice thing anymore. One of the um, good, uh, the nice functionalities of Skype is that uh, it can trigger what is called firewall testing. So uh, in order for a client to know what is his uh, firewall status, um, a super node will tell to another client, try to connect to this client and tell me if you, uh, tell him if you uh, manage to connect to him. Uh, so this thing is, that is, is done by sending a particular uh, command number with the IP address and the port number. Usually it's only done, since it's only done by Skype, it's only uh, used in order to know if a client is firewalled or not, if UDP goes through, if TC goes through. And it can be uh, um, a bit diverted uh, by specifying, when you can speak Skype, by specifying uh, any IP and uh, and uh, import. So uh, here are a few lines of uh, Skippy, which is the add-on for Skippy, uh, developed by Philip, that can um, be used in order to trigger a, sc a scan from a Skype client. Basically, you send a comment to Skype client saying, "Scan me this uh, this uh, IP and port," and uh, it will do that. So you can ping slash that. You can uh, TCP connect. Uh, every uh, single IP and port in a network or you can look, look for a MS SQL server inside the network. It's uh, pretty interesting and uh, they, they don't uh, seem to have think that some people might be able one day to speak Skype and then to use these comments in order to, um, to do some interesting things. Here is the, um, a capture of, uh, of uh, a scan um, launch to slash that using uh, UDP comments from an IP one two three four. So it's very uh, it's uh, using that you won't be able to have the result of uh, of uh, anything, but uh, the packet will go out and uh, and the client uh, that that would be a good way in order to launch uh, still uh, denial of services for example. Um, there is uh, one thing about uh, about Skype that is rather cool is that uh, each client can be either a simple node of the network or a super node. A super node is something that will receive the connections of uh, many clients and that will dispatch them, that will allow them to communicate with each other, and uh, and and. In fact, it will have better visibility of what is going on on the network, knowing who are the other super nodes, who are the, uh, the clients connected, and stuff like that. When a Skype client has a good score, uh, usually it's based on bandwidth and no firewall, and good CPU, and a uh, large uh, amount of memory, it can be promoted super nodes. Super node. Um, those super nodes are grouped by slots. Uh, you can find nine, to nine or ten super nodes uh, per slot. And uh, each block have, uh, has eight slots. Um, that's the, the nice thing is that you can have uh, once you know how to do that, you can have uh, the IPs of all the super nodes of Skype in the world, uh, sending some comments about listing uh, the, the super nodes. Uh, nowadays, uh, there are like 2,000 slots. Uh, this means around 20k of super nodes. Uh, every super node, uh, we haven't tried to uh, discover the, um, 
the lifetime of, of a supernova, but uh, it's usually not very high. It, uh, it turns uh, quite a lot, except for the, some, some machines that are connected in universities uh, um, that have a good bandwidth and quality of service. The good thing related to Supernod is that once you know how to speak Skype, you can promote uh, any client to Supernod by sending an uh, unauthenticated comment. So we can promote ourselves Supernod, and once we are Supernod, we can have nice information. Uh, Supernod has information about all the clients connected to him, so it means uh, he has all the bandwidth of the clients, all the memory, the OS version, and the Skype version uh, of each client. This means that uh, if you are a super nerd and, for example, you have a flow on Skype, maybe, uh, you can know every single version that is vulnerable to this flow uh, around the world. Uh, the, uh, sorry. the thing that has been removed uh, from Skype 2.5 is the ability to ban a super nerd. It was an unauthenticated command that you can send. So. Uh, you are, for example, a client, you send the UDP command to a supernode and the supernode will shut down for one hour. So based on the fact that you can know all the supernode addresses in the world and you can ban every single one of them for one hour, basically you, can, you could, before, shut down the entire Skype network in a couple of minutes. Uh, nobody has done that yet, I think, or we could have known about this. Um, so, I was talking about that. Uh, I will dig a bit into that. Um, it was like a, six months or eight months ago. For the <laughs> okay. Uh, there was a, a flow found in Skype by the people at the AVS. Um, and the, it was submitted to Skype, and Skype people patched it and only label that as a denial of service, which is basically what every vendor will do if he, you don't provide them the fully working exploit uh, universally working everywhere. So uh, the, the thing was that uh, when Skype wants to communicate, it will use uh, this type of thing, uh, an object list with the list size, then you can have numbers, IP and ports, a list of numbers, strings, or something and stuff like that. Each object has an ID, and uh, Skype know um, how to, to parse everything you see. And the thing is that uh, it does some very stupid thing. I think there was a slide before. Uh, I don't remember the, the, but that's exactly the flow that was in Skype. Uh, it gets the um, the size uh, on uh, the word, then it uh, multiplies it by four and does a local alloc. So uh, if you have uh, then, sorry, then uh, with the numbers provided, it will read all the numbers uh, and put them in the array you have just allocated. So if you have, uh, let's say that you have um, a number of uh, items that is this one, for example, you multiply it by four and give four. Skype will allocate four, four bytes and then try to read this number of items. So the good thing is that uh, when Skype can't read an item, it will stop the loop. So you don't have to overflow all the heap. You just have to allocate, let's say, uh, zero or four bytes. And then you can write any number of bytes you want uh, in, the, um, in the heap. So that's, uh, that's pretty much uh, a good overflow thing. Um, the good thing is that Skype is uh, heavily object oriented, so each time it, it wants to allocate an object, uh, it will do that in the heap, and with this object you will have constructors and destructors, and uh, some functions that are function pointers that are stored in the heap. So the good thing is that even on um, something that is uh, protected, let's say, with a um, uh, heap or an anti anti heap overflow uh, thing like like uh, Windows XP SP2, uh, you can basically just overflow the thing a bit, override the constructor of the destructor of the next object, and uh, before it does any allocate allocation uh, function, it will uh, use the pointer you provided and then uh, allow remote code execution. And those functions are often called, and even on XPSP2, the, the exploit was possible. So let's say we have 
all the um, all the superintendent IPs. We can all add all the client versions. We have a reliable exploit. Uh, we add a reliable exploit working on, on Skype. Everything goes on the network encrypted, so we can let's say we can have the biggest botnet ever with, with that, and uh, the the Skype people only say that it was a denial says um, whatever. Uh, that's the part of the cut that is responsible for the function pointer call. Um, you just have you overflow the, the, the stuff and then you control that and then you can uh, jump wherever you want uh, before any other allocation or deallocation uh, thing has been called. So there is no check on the cookie, on the hit cookie or stuff like that. Now, the good thing is that when we send that to Skype, Skype people uh, release the patch. So now they're checking uh, for the size to be uh, lower or equal to 3FFFFF. And then if it's not, it will trigger uh, an alert saying that there is an alloc size overflow. The problem is that we are talk talking about, we were talking about numbers, so 32 bits. So uh, the multiplication by was the multiplication done was multiplication by four. Uh, the problem is that, for example, for a list of IP and port, IP is four byte, port is two byte. So uh, the size of the data is six bytes. Uh, the problem is that they replicated that about 60 times in the cut, always using three FFFFF. But sometimes the register is not multiplied by four; it will multiply by five or six or eight. So their check is. A good for the given the flow we have given them, but not good for uh, things where it's multiplied by something bigger than before. So in fact, they haven't understood uh, exactly what was going on in their code. And yeah, let's shut again. Um, now that was the thing related to networking uh, regarding all that is going on in Skype. Now we will be looking to more. Uh, general staff uh, that are into Skype. The, the first thing is the filtering engine. There are many things going on. I've written many things like uh, how can they filter staff? Uh, what is the Chinese government looking into? Uh, what is going upon? So there is um, in the, on the website of the conference there is uh, a couple of files, uh, a couple of arch archives uh, related to some stuff I will show. But there is one for the filtering thing. Okay. Sorry for that. Uh, in fact, so there are two versions of Skype that will censor uh, some words. That's dump Skype and eBay.cn Skype. Uh, it will censor all the incoming message text used by the, um, the, the chat application. In fact, uh, you don't have to do much work in order to know what is going on. There is a an executable uh, content filter that is uh, that is shipped with those version of Skype and that will do all the work. In fact, it's a plugin that is verified and loaded automatically based by those versions of Skype, and uh, some words are matched against uh, an encrypted list of simplified Chinese expression. So the undocumented API that is used with that uh, is some thing, some things related to filtering. You have to say filtering on. Uh, to the, um, to the application, then each single message will go to the plugin. The plugin will say OK or block, and uh, if it's block, the, the message will never go to the user. So I have installed uh, this version of Skype. Uh, that's dumb Skype here, so the Chinese version. Uh, all the difference usually are one thing like that. There is a tab, uh, um, a tab uh, added here. Yeah. And, um, so there is another version of Skype in a virtual machine. It might take some time in order for the message to, uh, to come in. So uh, here I receive the message. And if I type, for example, uh, fuck, the word fuck will never go to uh, the Chinese version of Skype. Uh, that's I think I don't understand why. And uh, uh, the, I will go uh, in detail about the encrypted list a bit later in the cryptography part because it's encrypted using AES and we are the keys are coded in the binary so we can decrypt the file and read all the words. Uh, one other cool thing about the API is what is called AP2AP. 
uh, application to application. That's something that will allow two uh, applications to communicate through Skype. You have application A, A on the first machine, application B on the second machine. They will each plug to uh, their Skype version and communicate through Skype. So they benefit from a few things like the net and proxy bypassing abilities. Uh, the data is encrypted by Skype, so you can basically use everything you, you, you want and you need. It will be encrypted and sent to the other uh, party uh, peer. And um, the remote endpoint is only identified by login and not an IP address. That's really the best thing you could have done in order to do data exfiltration in a corporate network or something like that. That's one of the uses you could think about. Uh, exfiltration, discrete remote control of the machine, file transfer, networking connection to the uh, We did a couple of applications using that. Uh, there is a remote cmd.exe uh, that will be able to uh, be tunneled through Skype. Uh, there is a SOX 4 and 5 proxy, so you can tunnel every single network connection into a Skype. It will go through Skype to the other Skype and then go out uh, at the second peer. And we have AP to AP kill and stuff. Um, I will try and do a demonstration if it works. Um, on this on this computer, uh, I will launch the master plugin. The master plugin will listen to uh, connection. It will attach to Skype and listen to connection. So, okay, uh, there's the um, the dialog that that asks me if I want to load the plugin. Yes, I want to load the plugin. So now it's connected. I will press that. And in the VMware, um, I will launch the slave plugin. The slave plugin will spawn a cmd.exe, redirects all the inputs and outputs through Skype to the master and give full control uh, over the machine to the master. So I uh, only have to specify the username of the person I want to connect to. Here is the, the dialog. I will go into the dialog thing a bit later. So now, if everything goes well, I have the cmd.exe on the uh, remote machine. So if I type, for example, um, there is a bit of, um, of delay, uh, so I have to type another comment. So now I can, sp I can control everything on the remote machine, and I, I, I don't have the time to uh, send it a ethereal, but you will see, uh, the only things you will see are encrypted Skype traffic. So uh, if I do uh, director listing, if I do anything, everything is encrypted by Skype, sent over the network. Uh, for example, it can go through one relay manager uh, out of here, or it can communicate directly, but everything is, uh, is encrypted, goes through net, goes goes through proxy and uh, and, you, and uh, is quite anonymous. Because if it goes through a relay, you don't have the IP of the destination uh, peer. You uh, only have the username. You might only have the username. Uh, so now we'll be studying a bit uh, the cryptography uh, in Skype. Yes? I'm sorry. sorry. Can you do any of the other commands using the API, the plugin API? Like Ports, client and stuff, or you have control of your own client. You have control of your own client, and uh, you can do whatever you want. With, like you can do uh, with the mouse and keyboard on your client, okay. like adding contacts, uh, removing contacts, sending calls. You can call with the API, so you can proxify call uh, if you have some things. So, so the other things you need to implement your own program. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the first uh, interesting thing is the randomness, the Skype random number generator. It's uh, it's pretty tough, in fact, and it's a good point since uh, in all the cryptography we will be uh, relying on that. So uh, you have a large buffer here. Uh, some stuff uh, are filled with uh, with some uh, APIs. So, so that's all Windows stuff. Uh, and then there's Shawan done on some things. There is a seed. Uh, a global seed that is updated each time, and it will return uh, eight bytes uh, through a, a small SHA-1 uh, function. So it's quite strong. Um, it gives a, a good base, base for all the cryptographic stuff that is going after that. And but surprisingly, when you look, in, uh, you, you look at that, 
There are a few um, weird things. Uh, for example, if there is two consecutive um, execution of the function, uh, get the count will be the same, message chain will be the same, thread ID, process ID will be the same. And uh, for example, here, um, uh, UUID is uh, 16 bytes and they only use 12 bytes because the rest is overwritten by this. And the cursor pause is 8 bytes and they will only use 4 bytes so that since uh, the rest is overwritten. So they don't use the, the full possibilities of the APIs they are using, maybe it's wanted or not, but we couldn't break anything uh, with that. The good thing is that not all uh, the fields are filled. So there are a lot of data that is, in fact, coming from other uh, function calls that are remaining in the stack, and those uh, the, the stack layout isn't zeroed or anything. So there are a lot of pointers and stuff that depends on the flow of execution uh, before, and that's a good thing. Uh, the first thing we, uh, one of the things we did, and that was totally useless, in fact, is that there is, there are two Easter eggs. Uh, that were removed uh, in the, the version 2.0.0.103. So it means that Skype people read our slides because if we talked about that at uh, Black Hat and then it's gone. Uh, the, it's triggered by the comment in the chat window slash ad with the, the secret. Uh, there are two secrets implemented. The first, there are two conditions. The first one is the length equals to 6 and the series is to 32 equals to that. The second one is uh, length 14 and uh, the CRC 32 is that. The algorithm used is um, um, self-modifying XOR, so a bit complicated. You can you can do that uh, quite simply. The first the first uh, attack, if we can call that an attack, is a brute force on the CRC 32. Uh, the first uh, Easter egg is prayer. It will give you a text if you if you type slash ad prayer in the chat window. It will give you a text about it being damned forever and whatever. Um, and the second one uh, was a bit harder to do because we couldn't brute force that. So uh, there was a small transformation that was to to be carried out in the cipher in order to to make that like a standard visionary cipher and do a statical cryptanalysis on that in order to find uh, the address email of the developer of the chat module. So it was uh, absolutely uh, useless. Um, here is the cryptic text. You can find the binary. No, you, can, you can't find it anymore. Here is the key and here is the decrypted text. So uh, he, he's born in 1979. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the fun things to do now uh, is uh, is the Skype logs. Uh, Skype can generate logs. Usually, uh, when you go on the Skype um, <coughs> site website, there is some uh, things you can go to, and it will say if you have problem with Skype, um, click on that uh, registry thing that is included in the website uh, of the conference, and uh, it will generate some log file uh, that you can send uh, to us in order for us to debug what is going on with you. Uh, the thing is, in fact, there are two registry keys in our Windows Login and Login 2. Uh, the first one, if set, will generate encrypted log files in order to send them to Skype. And Skype has a second uh, registry key that um, will allow to uh, have clear text log files and uh, those values are hashed in the binary, so you can't find the good ones. Um, to enable logs, you can patch the binary. Uh, that's the first solution. But you will have to get rid of all the integrity check first. But that's something we can do. Uh, the second thing would be to recover the correct values. Uh, but they are out of brute forcing range, so we, can, uh, we have to uh, go around that. If we check uh, the log encryption scheme, uh, in fact, Skype will generate 128-bit uh, key, uh, RC4 keys in order to encrypt the logs on the fly. 
uh, it's formatted and padded a bit, uh, and then it's uh, the, the key, the padded key, is encrypted using RSA, then put into the log. So when you send that to Skype, Skype will get the log file, get the part where, uh, where there is your RSA, decrypt your RSA, get the key in that, and with the key decrypt the rest of the log file. So uh, here is the. Um, the format, uh, there is blog uh, written, uh, written here, uh, then two, then time, then the RC4 key, then zeros, there is a one here. Hopefully there is a one because E3, so if there has been, hadn't been a one, uh, RSA wouldn't have been necessary at all. Um, the thing is that uh, the first attack we thought about is the Coppersmith attack. Uh, basically says that if uh, you know more than uh, the square root, uh, if, e is, e, if e is 3 and you know more than the square root uh, of bits of that, which is the case since we, uh, we know that everything is 0 here, we know the 8 first bytes here, uh, we have to guess the time and uh, 128 bits, you can record the clear, the clear text uh, message. But it was, it's way too complicated to implement that because it, it needs like matrix reduction, or I don't know if the English term is correct, but uh, it was way too complicated. So uh, we had to look at the RC4 key format. Uh, when you look at that, you see that the 128 bits are uh, gathered like this. There is a time here, the time at the end, get tick count here, get tick count times uh, 1000 here. Uh, the thing you have to know is that the log files are formatted as debug dash uh, 2006 that dash months dash day. So you have the year, you have the months, you have the day. So uh, for the time, you only to have uh, to brute force 60 seconds uh, in order to find this field. And then you have to brute force one of those two. Usually you will brute force the first one. And then uh, you have um, the ability to uh, to find the uh, RC4 key. If you have the RC4 key, you're, you can try and decrypt um, the text. So the attack is provided on the, on the website. Uh, it, all you have to do is uh, an attack that will carry out uh, like um, lower than two to the power 24 computations in order to have uh, the RC4 key. Then you can decrypt the log, uh, which. If Skype is started uh, at Windows Startup, which is most of the, the time the case, uh, get tick count is very low, and you have uh, the, um, the RC4 key uh, almost instantly. Uh, you can try with the, 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 bind, the, the source provided. Uh, and of, of course, in order to have the, RC, the, the encrypted log files, you have to go to the website of Skype and um, put the first registry key, that is Skype Debug 2003, that is uh, in that. Um, I will then do the demonstration. Uh, the second type of file that is generated uh, is the trace file, that's the voice over IP um, trace file. Uh, the encryption is much, much uh, simpler, it's a simple XOR with a 31 uh, byte key. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's in there, there's a source file also in that. So you can decrypt with one, um, with the, the public uh, registry key, you can decrypt log and you can decrypt traces. And you can find uh, funny things when you have decrypted the, the logs. You can, for example, uh, have stack dumps here. Uh, Skype says there is a possible deadlock here. Or there are assert failures here. Uh, we had a couple of dusts that were fixed due to asserts like that uh, and some failing um, of the Skype protocol. So uh, I'll go now on still that cryptography, that's the plugin signing stuff. Uh, I posted uh, um, an entry on OpenRC about that. In fact, uh, like you saw just uh, some minutes before, there is a, each time you launch a plugin, there is a dialog that says, do you want to continue, uh, do you want to block, do you want to always uh, launch the plugin, or do you want to ask each time. In fact, that's based on uh, what is what should be a signature of the plugin that is added to the configuration file here. And that is uh, this, key one, key two, key three, with uh, some stuff uh, behind that. The thing, that's the dialogue. 
the thing is that you can do uh, almost whatever you want with plugins since the, uh, the algor algorithm is rather simple. Uh, you have a salt, uh, elementary penguin singing Hare Krishna. Um, <laughs> and with that it will do uh, MD5 of the path and the binary and then MD5 of the path with per mid, per before and mid after in order to have uh, the the key, key one, key two, and key three is only the last uh, handle to the window of the, the plugin. Uh, there is also the um, there is also the binary for that uh, in the um, in the um, in the conference. So if uh, you use sign plugin here, uh, you use sign plugin with the full pass to the plugin. Then you have that to add the co to the configuration file. Then you can launch every plugin you want, and there will never be a pop-up showing. That would be, I would think, the first step to a Skype plugin virus in order to go through anything. So uh, I don't think the, these, uh, the way they choose to do that was the good one, but uh, I don't have anything to propose in the comments. Uh, the last thing. Uh, uh, dealing with cryptography, or almost the last thing, is the encrypted uh, Chinese blacklist. So you can get the key file, uh, what they call the key file, which is an encrypted, uh, AES encrypted uh, file of words. Um, the keys are coded in the binary content filter.exe. And only the first, it's uh, in Unicode, so there are 62, 64, sorry bytes and only the first uh, 32 bytes are used and then you will have the, um, here the result so you can you can uh, open that with uh, for example Internet Explorer and that's all the regular expressions with all the words so if you put that into Google translation you will have some stuff like uh, uh, sex stuff and uh, some things related to Taiwan and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, and sex and, and stuff. And there are some IPs are art coded in here. So as you can see, there is uh, no check on uppercase and lowercase. So they put one line all in uppercase and one line on, all in lowercase. So if you put fuck like F uppercase U C K, but it will go to uh, that's totally useless. <laughs> You mentioned that it, it censors some IPs as well. Is there anything stopping from people from just downloading the non-Tom or non-Chinese version? No, the, uh, you can go on Tom.com and download the Chinese version and use it on your computer. That's the only thing it will block with the IP is that someone sending you in text message the IP uh, 60 does something or something in the chat window, then it will block that. So that, that's, um, that's not very useful. Um, the, um, one of the curious things uh, we found is during the exchange, uh, so I want to communicate with Fabrice, for example, using Skype. And uh, so uh, each peer will generate 120 bits random nodes uh, and extend it by repeating it, so uh, 128, then put it at before, put it before, put it before, then encrypt it using uh, his public key. Then uh, he will decrypt that, and uh, he will generate half the session key, and he will do the same, and will generate half the session key based on the random nodes, and uh, we'll put that together, and we'll have the full session key in order to communicate with each other. The thing is that if you do that, uh, it's basically uh, doing uh, the multiplication uh, of uh, the, the message, uh, the random nodes, x, uh, times a constant, the constant is described here. So if you do some RSA, uh, you will have the um, modular exponentiation, but since there is a constant, you can deduce uh, that uh, you only have to uh, attack a message that is x, that is only 128 bits, uh, to the power e mod n. Uh, the thing is that the best known attack for that is in 2 uh, power 64, uh, to the power 64, that's here, uh, we can't attack that, 
but probably some people have the power to do that. I thought about NSA or stuff like that. If you can do this, uh, if you can attack the half session key, you can then record uh, the random nodes. From the random nodes, uh, you can record the half session key, and then with two half session keys, uh, you can decrypt uh, communication. That's that's a weird thing. That's not uh, attackable by uh, public persons. But two uh, to the power 64 is rather low for something that should be uh, two uh, to the power 1 and 28. 128 or even more. Uh, the last thing, uh, I, I don't think I have searched for uh, Skype recovery, password recovery utilities and stuff like that. Uh, in fact, uh, I haven't found any, and uh, so I had to look into that how it was going on. Uh, there are, again, some tools uh, on the website of the conference. Um, so, if told to, if told to uh, Skype will save in config.xml file to login uh, md5 um, hash. Uh, the generated RSA private key, uh, I don't know if anyone sees what's the problem here. Uh, and the Skype encrypted uh, corresponding RSA private key. So on your computer are stored uh, hash, your private key, and your public key. Uh, and it's encrypted, but in a symmetric way, because Skype has to be able to uh, get the private key back, so anyone can get the private key back if he wants to. The algor algorithm used are uh, crypto protect data and unprotect data, uh, some SHA-1, some AES-256 bits, uh, some fast track cipher, I didn't know about that, but it's something that does CRC32 and XOR and uh, 100, uh, 1024 bits, heresy. Uh, the credential structure has changed with version 2.5, so this thing is, is valid up to 2.0.107. Um, the credential structure is uh, 16 bytes for the MD5 hash, 128 bytes uh, for the private key, then some um, the thing I uh, show uh, a bit earlier with the username, the public key, the SHA-1, and the BC byte, and two bytes for CFE32 reduced. So uh, what you have to do to decrypt the credentials uh, is uh, record the um, token uh, encrypted in this uh, key. So since it uses crypto protect data, I don't know if you know that API, but it's dependent on the user logged in the machine. Uh, so usually only the user who has encrypted the stuff can decrypt that using uh, crypto and protect data. Then you use increment counter uh, mode SHA-1 to create a 32 byte key from the token. This token, uh, this key is used then uh, in a incremental content mo mode AES to decrypt the credentials, uh, and now you have the MD5 hash that is decrypted. Then to decrypt the second layer, you have to use the MD5 hash as a key for the fast track cipher, so it will decrypt the rest of the credentials. Now you have the private key decrypted, and then for the third layer, you have to use the correct Skype public key in order to decrypt uh, the blob and record the, uh, your RSA public key. So basically, you have everything ciphered here, then you have the MD5 in clear, then the encrypted data there, there then uh, two blocks in clear, and the encrypted data there, and then everything in clear. Um, so when the usage of that is uh, you can do Skype password recovery. Uh, you have the hash, you have the login, you have the middle string. So all you have to do is uh, brute force the password. Uh, dictionary attack or brute force attack. The, the, the person has well chosen this uh, Skype password. Uh, it it won't it won't work. But uh, usually it's not the case uh, since Skype users are most often not very aware of security. Uh, and um, what you can do with the RSA private key, uh, if you manage to get the two RSA private keys of two people, uh, for example, you have sniffed the conversation between two people, and then you manage to get into the computers of the two people, then you can get the RSA private keys of the two people uh, and decrypt the 128 bits random nouns exchange, compute half, both half keys, and then. Uh, can decrypt the whole conversation. But that's 
that implies either an intrusion on both of the computers or a physical access to both of the of the machines, and then to get into the account uh, of the of the user and uh, decrypt the stuff. Uh, so to conclude, I would say that uh, Skype is a <coughs> wonderful example that uh, auditing a binary in its complete form is much more accurate than auditing a portion of the source. I don't know if you heard about this study that was carried out, carried out on Skype uh, cryptographic parts. It was uh, very nice, but in fact yeah, hasn't given uh, everything to the guy who did the, the study. I don't remember his name, the guy from Shru, I think. Um, the thing you have to um, to keep in mind is uh, Skype Inc. doesn't uh, tell you everything. And one of the, the most beautiful examples is that uh, with 2.5, they are silently patching more and more stuff. Uh, everything doesn't appear in the change logs. Uh, and uh, for example, some comments are no TCP only. Uh, you have features that have been trashed. For example, the, the, the possibility to ban a super node has been, uh, has been removed in the latest version. So Skype people are, I think, working hard in order to improve the security of the stuff, but they only do that silently and based on public presentations of people. How long ago was 2.5 released? Sorry? How long ago was It, it was three days ago. Uh, they are testing how fast you can reverse it, I think. It's done. I know, but I mean, they are releasing it before the yeah. conference, so they can know how far you can get. Yeah, I think so. Okay. <laughs> I think it's that. Yeah. So uh, some grids. Uh, yeah, a lot of grids to Philip. We did a lot of work on Skippy and Skippy and, and stuff. And questions, if you have any. Um, quick, uh, quick questions. Yes. Sir. Is there an integrity check on the uh, bad words uh, in Perfect Five? There is, um, in fact, yes, uh, each time the content filter.exe will do an MD5, and if it doesn't correspond uh, with the, um, the MD5 of the key file, it will download it again uh, on the net. But uh, if someone, uh, it, the, the binary is dealt fine, not encrypted, it's uh, a, a two byte patch in order to avoid those things. So uh, using Tom Skype or the content folder that takes you from Tom Skype is definitely not a protection for the Chinese government. Well, thank you. Daniel.